it's a really nice relationship and collaborative process because you you kind of have to work together and balance off each other it's not one who's better than the other i don't think i think it's a very kind of even relationship Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and today I will be speaking with Visual House's founder and CEO, Robert Herrick, and head of production, Matea Luzingani. Visual House is an ideal fit for the world's leading property developers, uh, designers and agencies, and particularly those companies that are looking to position their projects in a very desirable and a refined and elevated way. They offer a full service creative agency that establishes real estate brands. They work with a lot of the iconic real estate uh, companies around the world and in lots of different locations, including Los Angeles, New York, Miami, London, Hong Kong, and Dubai. So they're really working in the centers of real estate across the planet. And uh, Visual House is they're a multidisciplinary team. They've got creative thinkers, strategists, artists who all work collaboratively. Um, they are very skilled at taking an idea and transforming it into incredible visual imagery. And they really do bring real estate brands to life and create a lot of value through very intelligent ways of storytelling and imagery. So Today's episode was really interesting. We spoke a lot about the benefits of outsourcing and using 3D visualizers. And it's a very competitive market. And I'm sure if you're an architect, you just all got to do is link let's log on to your LinkedIn and you'll see 200 uh, 3D visualizers sending you an email or a message saying, please use me. And I think this is where Visual House really stands out from the, the crowd just because of their, their innovation, their business prowess, and also the team and the experience that they have of being able to really deliver um, an enormous amount of value to architects and to developers, and not just in producing beautiful imagery, but actually a complete suite of marketing services which cater to the entire uh, built environment. I think that's really a a very kind of intelligent business move that they've that they've made, and really makes a, a big difference. We also see. The, the enormous advances in technology uh, which Visual House are using, Unreal Engine and other sorts of infrastructure and how they have developed and set up these international offices where they're working incredibly closely with some really big name architects from, from Fosters uh, to your Genslers to all sorts of other architects. So fascinating conversation. Lots of golden nuggets here. Really interesting to hear how this company has developed. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Visual House. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Robert, Matea, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Good, good. Thank you for having us. A pleasure. So oh, thanks. very excited to be speaking with you. You, I think you're actually, you're one of the first CGI specialists um, that we've had on the on the podcast, I was very interested when I spoke with you last time, Robert. So, Robert, you're the you're the, the founder, Matea. You're the the head of the production department. You're an architect as well in a former life. You've worked at uh, David Chipperfield, and you're kind of you're the one that makes the magic happen. I understand. <laughs> I guess we all do in in, in our own way. Um, we all have specialties, obviously. But yeah, uh, it's a very collaborative process. Great. And it, it's really interesting to be speaking with a, 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 a visualizer, if you like, because this is something that is a market, certainly over the last 10, 15 years, that's absolutely exploded. And any architect who's got a LinkedIn account knows how they're bombarded with CGI specialists, you know, promoting their services. But the offering that you guys uh, and, and the kind of the outlook that you're presenting as a kind of more of a vertically, vertically integrated 
suite of marketing services, I thought was incredibly innovative and very thoughtful. And no doubt a big part of the success and how you guys have grown to a company where you've got offices uh, in the UK and in, in the US. And well, how big's the team now? Over 50? Around no, 50? It's, it's under 50. Um, it's, um, you know, 30, almost 40 sort of full time. And then a right. lot of contractors as well, um, mm -hmm. you know, sort of people on sort of set contracts with us too but it's it's still sort of circa 50 i guess is a, is a sort of total head count but um yeah great and so you're working with not just architects but property developers and you know you're really real estate brokers and really helping provide marketing collateral to enhance those kinds of brands definitely yeah i mean the company started um in sort of 2008 really officially um, and it was really just a rendering house, you know, effectively. We were producing mm -hmm. renderings for a range of different uh, projects, um, you know, all around the world, working a lot with um, different developers, uh, a lot of architects, including, you know, close friends like Compass and Fox, Foster and Partners, SOM, mm -hmm. lots of different people. And we really kind of had like work with a wide spectrum of different architects and developers to produce kind of quite key set renderings effectively on sort of quite noteworthy projects from there it really evolved to a a full full marketing agency i, I think effectively like six years ago and that's when it kind of really sort of changed that shift and that was really sort of the integration of um, a creative team so we obviously had a production team that was producing rendering work and it was very very collaborative with our clients and then we shifted to clients ask us, developer clients saying like, hey, can you kind of work on brochure work? Can you work on websites? You know, what's the what's the sort of t total gamut of your work? And I think it naturally sort of evolved from that really from sort of client requests. Mm -hmm. um, and it really, um, uh, really kind of spawned out of that. And we just saw a huge demand really to become a full service agency, um, a, a lot more in the market. Um, and that initially obviously started with like working with a lot of commercial clients on the resident on the um, on the commercial side on the um, uh, developer side. Um, it was really sort of like working on sort of like leasing brochures, uh, sort of tactical pitches for leasing operations, um, and then that really kind of full really went into sort of full scope entire brand campaigns for projects in a way. And now we have kind of these set departments across Visual House that deliver sort of full, full scope, cohesive projects across sort of the luxury sector of real estate, whether it's commercial or residential. It, it's quite an interesting part of the design process to be involved in. And certainly when you're working with developers, because a developer might have like half an idea, if you like, and then they've got to yes. sell something to yes. a lot of people. So the imagery that you're producing is pretty crucial because it's like the thing that's you know going to be the yes or no the make or break of a of a, of yeah. a deal in, in many cases but yet you're you're working with not always you know you don't have complete information about the site and you know, you, you, you're a key part of any design team how do you you know what what's some of the the challenges that you find in that and how do you make it work I'll let me see you handle that one yeah i think that's a very valid point and i think this is where our sort of architectural background comes into play, especially when uh, when we talk about interior styling, mm -hmm. um, especially for office spaces or residential spaces, we often have to deal with just an empty floor plate that we have to uh, fill out with uh, with something, you know, uh, that has a, has a soul, has a brand, and it kind of also has to relate very well to the, the overall branding of the building that we're selling or uh, the architecture that it's being sold. So it's, um, it's, uh, it's very challenging, but this is, this is where I think Visual House is very good at. Mm -hmm. We have yeah. a team of their designers and, and architects to do that. We're, we're pretty good at sort of filling in the gaps, I'd say, effectively. And that's, that's sort of what, what comes sort of quite naturally to us as a sort of team of architects. And that's what I think the industry change we've seen more and more that's happened. I think that uh, a lot of people, when it comes to sort of the typical rendering process in particular, or VR animation and beyond, you know, you're seeing a lot of um, architects more and more weighing into their visualization departments or firms or, or, or different creatives to kind of help communicate uh, a bit more of their ideas that can kind of help them along the way. Mm -hmm. But I think that hasn't really changed, you know, even back in the day when we were sort of 
sat in KPS offices and Alan Martin was producing his beautiful sketches, he was doing exactly the same thing um, mm-hmm. when, um, uh, you know, when, when sort of communicating sort of untold design, I guess, is the sort of the, the, the theory. Is there a, 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 you know, challenge in terms of balancing, overstepping the mark, if you like, between putting in too much design info and then architects being like, well, hold on a minute, we've got to be the ones delivering that. How do you kind of make sure that that relationship that target, that push and pull is is effective if it works? Uh, I think we, we're really sort of taking direction from the architects. So we're mm-hmm. really kind of driven by them. But it's all very often that they're saying, hey, fill in the blanks a little bit. And so we have a go and then they have comments on it and it goes backwards and forwards. I can't actually think of a point where they've said, that's not your job, that's our job. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't think that's happened yet to my knowledge, but... Uh, but yeah, I guess it could do. But we wouldn't want that to happen, obviously. Cause we well, I, I, I always remember when I, when I worked at RSHP, um, mm. they had a they had a, a number of outs, you know, a, external teams that were involved in the visualization of projects. And it what became very a very powerful alliance was when the visualizers really knew how to make a building look like an RSH building, RSHP yes. building, with minimal amount of input. And yes. it would be a few hand sketches and these visualize and actually I think the visualizers actually worked. Some of them worked for RSP, RSHP previously, so they had a good grasp of it. But what it meant was that you had this incredible ability to have half an idea, have it fleshed out by the the, the kind of the, the visualizer house, and it was like, Oh wow, that's that does that looks like a bit that looks like one of our buildings. So so how how do you develop that kind of relationship with a with a new client or in just in general, the, the filling in the blank process, if you like. I mean, I guess I, I think in my experience, I, I, I work both in in-house and in an architecture visualization firm. So I, I think I have a pretty good understanding of how, how the process is in, in both industries, in both mm-hmm. cases, because they actually differ quite a lot. So when you work in the house as a visualizer, you tend to be really the right hand of a designer. Mm-hmm. So exactly what you just you, you were just mentioning, um, you take a sketch and you develop it from there. Maybe you see angles that they haven't seen. I mean, from some angles, you discover some issues with the design. And then it's a, it's a very collaborative process of back and forth, constant back and forth, long hours as well. Obviously, uh, mm-hmm. to get a good design, it's always about refining detail and refining, refinement. Um, on our end, I think what we have to deal with, especially um, visual house, is a more refined design. So it's very rare that you know, an architect come to us for um, with like a very a sketchy idea, and uh, and then uh, it will just ask us to come up with some some type of options. Mm-hmm. I think these options are more related to perhaps um, you know camera angles, um, options with materiality. We, we do a lot. Um, you know, try some different combinations of design or facade uh, combinations. So it's it's slightly different um, for us how we we really uh, collaborate with uh, with uh, with an architecture firm. Let's say. How has the business been able to develop so much and and, and move beyond again you know a, a very saturated market now to what you know what you're doing currently how, how what have been some of the secrets or some of the successes or some of the things that you think you've been doing really really well that have allowed you to expand well, it's such, that's such a great question, um, and I love like the history of our industry. So <laughs> I got some to, to interesting answers, I think. But it, it's so crazy how um, how the industry has changed. I mean, when I first started the company, there was minimal. There was competition, but there wasn't that much competition like you know you would sort of see now. And I think that you know at the very beginning, the company had sort of. Um, good success because we were like super collaborative and we we still are we definitely are like very very collaborative it's in our nature but we were like so collaborative to the point that we were going into architectures off you know architects offices you know to the point that our for our second new york office was actually in kpf's offices because we right. were working so much on the hudson yards project and we were like we were there basically the entire time working hand in hand with the architects 
going through the design process, literally making comments on screen with them. And so we were like, had this very, very close collaboration process. So we built up this great network of projects in doing that in a way. We worked on Abu Dhabi Airport for four years with KPF. We worked on Hudson Yards with them for a long period of time, Foster and Partners, loads of different projects, you know, similar sort of architecture firms in a way. Um, uh, Lucian Stokes in Sandland, lots of ones in London, et cetera, et cetera. And um, that sort of collaborative process meant that we got a connection to the actual developers as well. So they would come in to the client's offices and sort of say, hey, you know, hey, Visual House, Rob, what are you guys working on? And we would kind of end up working hand in hand with the developers. That in turn then said, well, hang on a minute, could you guys do this and this and this for us, which mm -hmm. then evolved to more sort of full scope work. It was very much a reactional sort of process. And we said, yeah, sure, we can kind of start to work on that. We can hire the teams that can build into those things. And then that really kind of that collaborative in-house experience of working side by side with the architects and developers really evolved to us forming quite a lot of offices, different staff members that turn into like the full service agency, basically. But um, now the market is so different, you know, mm -hmm. from where we sort of first began. We're seeing like a lot of these very kind of design orientated uh, rendering firms coming out uh, that are very kind of sketch style, quite sort of illustrative type images in a way that work very, very quickly, very fast. Uh, and they work very, very close to um, in collaboration with a lot of great architecture firms as well. And that we've seen a huge amount of oversaturation that I'm sure you get emails 10 times a day saying, hey, let's do a rendering for a hundred bucks or something. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, it's very, very common with our clients. But I think that the thing that sort of separates us is we're there. You mm -hmm. know, we're in New York, we're in Miami, we're in Los Angeles, we're in Dubai and Hong Kong and working closely with our clients in those set locations in a way. So it's always been that uh, that physical presence, I think, that's that sort of separated us and allowed us to sort of grow so much. I guess but, uh, that, that's, that's very that, that's very interesting that you've actually put a, quite a bit of focus on establishing physical presences in all these different mm. locations where clients are, particularly when the nature of your work is so digital yeah. that you wouldn't need yeah. to. What, <laughs> yeah. what, what's been the driver of that? I, that's I mean, the driver of that was really to build close collaboration you know, effectively to grow the business. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we want to work hand in hand. So we're on the tip of everyone's tongue when it comes to that sort of next project in a way. But the shift of COVID just changed everything. Yeah. You know, that close collaboration wasn't, it was impossible. We had to mm -hmm. sort of move into the digital world. So now we have, instead of the business was run as offices in the past, it was, you know, the Hong Kong office, the New York office, the London office, et cetera, et cetera. And they're all run individually. Um, but now they're departments. So we have creative, digital and production, all, but all the staff are all around the world and they're all working together. And we found that it's way more efficient, much, much better. And it, it really has just sort of led to a greater speed of growth within the company, I guess, in the past sort of two years. So it's it's definitely oh. um, that physical environment has moved to a great shift as well, I would say. Fantastic. So w when is the best time for you to jump into working on a project? And and do, and do you do you work do you work like right at the early stages and then kind of stop or do you work all the way through? Uh, so we will work right at the very very early stages, even sometimes before the architects are commissioned, which is crazy. Oh wow! So we have um, yeah, which is <laughs> bizarre because so we're creating branding content before the design's finished. Then the design gets finished, and then the production teams, Matthias team, come on board to start creating all of the rendering CGI work and everything else that goes into all the website work we've already created and everything else. So we're kind of way earlier than the architects are very often now, um, which is which is even bizarre <laughs> in a way, because it used to be driven by the architects whenever they're at that mm -hmm. certain stages, I guess. Yeah. Well, that's that's really fascinating. Does that, have you found that that's led, led into then um, your designs or the, your visualizations um, influencing the choice of architect? From the client's perspective um no because we 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 wouldn't be doing like exterior visualizations without any design at all this right. would just be sort of like creative work at the very beginning of a project and then once the architect is selected then we'll create the rendering work after it mm -hmm. they've definitely we've definitely more recently had hey which interior designers do you guys like or you know which ones have you sort of um you know is there anyone you would put forward or more sort of creative 
overall like bigger picture creative direction on a, or a collaboration on projects we sort of found but um but i would say uh no we don't we don't sort of get into that sort of realm great and and how have you been able to you know the obviously the business has gone through uh, a, a quite a, a growth expansion how have you found that both your roles have changed since the business has has grown i'm sure matthias has changed the most <laughs> yeah um i mean obviously i was um before covid i was very much more involved into the day-to-day -day production uh, so really working with the team on field let's, mm -hmm. let's say that way um so the actual production of 3d assets and receiving the, the models from the architect, elaborating the information and translating those information into CGI work or CGI content. Mm -hmm. I think from for me, uh, in the last two years, it's been very much a bigger transition to a more managerial role, mm -hmm. where I oversee really the um, the operations of, of my team, so making sure that the team flows really well and the the output production is as fast as possible. Obviously. Um, we're, we're very much business oriented as well. So mm -hmm. we want to make sure that there are no gaps and, and there are no missing, missing um, assets in, in the process. And whenever there are gaps, um, I, I step in and make sure that those gaps are filled. Um, talking about missing piece of the puzzle, a project is not complete, how we solve that issue. We are, especially recently where We've been very much involved with uh, a very big scope um, projects. Um, we came to the conclusion that at the end of the, the, the overall production, the design has changed so much. So that would have meant re, uh, redo the whole set of images, CGI animation. That would have that would have been such a, such a big hassle. So we came up with some solutions that avoided, uh, you know. Um, more costs on the client side and also you know more streamlined production on our end mm -hmm. how, um, how, how how do you manage the efficiencies inside of this kind of production process because uh, i guess we have the, the the idea of the when i look at some of our clients is um time sheets for all their staff it's always the guys in the rendering studio whose hours have just gone through the roof um and so i, I imagine you know you know, we often think of the cliche of everyone's working late into the night, they're rendering stuff, they've got to re-render it. How do you keep a control on this in terms of you know, making sure that you're able to deliver the project on time, on budget, and like reel that kind of, you know, that part of the process in? This is a very interesting, actually. And I think what we really pride ourselves is we don't work late hours. By any means. I mean, we work the right amount of time to produce mm -hmm. the best and uh, best quality that we possibly can. I remember very well how it felt working in house as a as a visualizer. Yeah, and it, it, this doesn't come uh, anywhere close to it. Um, normally, like a team in house would be sort of working on the fly, like you had an issue and you had to solve it. I think for us is making sure that at the start of the project, we have a very clear schedule ahead. Um, we normally make sure that the client knows that schedule and we have a very good way of estimating how long a set of images or um, um, a round of iteration will take. Normally, we, we, tend to, we tend to say one image per artist per week. Some artists are faster, some artists are slightly slower. Mm -hmm. So like, we know very much the, our team and we know how what's, what's the, the, the maximum output that we can extract from the team without, you know, overworking them. Um, well, obviously, we use a lot of um, online softwares, like Asana, for instance, is right. one of them, just to make sure that, you know, all the puzzles is also visual for everyone to to see and it uh, that helps really really a lot um because it doesn't leave anything to 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 any guesswork mm -hmm. um so everything is written down it's very visual so you can adapt it too so it's very intuitive but besides that you also have to have a very good uh, technology base so you need to have a very good infrastructure 
And this is where we have been investing quite a lot in the last two years, just to building up something that was state of the art and um, and allowed us to to have that high output that we were looking for. Because sometimes the bottleneck was really the production output. Mm-hmm. Like you could actually like you you get the work done as far as the file is prepped, the file is ready, you can hit render, but the rendering time would take hours. Yes. Yeah. Hours on a, on a one-time basis is nothing. Maybe one or two hours, I get a coffee, I go outside. But if you look at like 200 images per month, 300 images per month, then it equates to a huge amount of time that we're wasting. Yeah. So having, having the, the technology and infrastructure that allows for a fast output um, we basically, at, I mean, at, at this stage of, of the development, and uh, I think we'll, we, have, we wait about like two, three minutes per image. That's wow. how efficient the process is. Um, so there is no time waste. I mean, the artists can go and get coffee, but then uh, they would return and the, the render at 7,000 pixels would be ready for them. So that, that was not the case even like three, four years ago. You would have needed like a massive amount of... Uh, course um at your disposal so we have a thing called the dojo <laughs> which is uh, <laughs> amazingly named but Matty and the team have this like wild render farm which is made up of like it's in this specialist office which has all crazy air conditioning system dedicated for it and uh this thing is like a beast it's called the dojo it's absolutely insane and um it's i'm not sure how many i mean how many cpus do we have like there isn't it like like thousand or something? i mean it's uh it's uh it's very much expandable so it could could be a thousand it could be two thousand it really depends um yeah it's very flexible but it's also cpu oriented oriented and gpu oriented and then i think we'll get to that later when we talk about the future and where we're heading towards so i think like and matthias is like absolutely right i remember like back in the day and I was te- we went on a company retreat recently and I was had everyone kind of huddle around and tell them all about the history of rendering, which is incredibly boring, I think, for a lot of people, but fascinating for some. And I was telling them about the times where we were working on Abu Dhabi Airport until sort of like 5 a.m. in the morning. And we were having to, the roof of the building that KPF designed and the modeling they had done in parametric was so heavy. It had to be mm. rendered separately on its own and then the interior separately as well. And I would sit there until 4 a.m. just looking at this pixel render, <laughs> <that> you <laughs> watching paint dry, just thinking, oh, my God, I hope this thing's going to finish. And it would, like, you'd take about eight hours to render half the image and then eight hours to render half the image. And then hopefully if you came back after a few hours sleep, it looked okay. But, <laughs> you know, How, very often it didn't. <laughs> well, that, that's really interesting as well. Like, I like amazing now it sounds like that like the kind of technology is there where it's actually a it's lot instant. more re- responsive yeah. how did you in the past then deal with things like scope changes like you just spent 16 hours <laughs> rendering something and then the uh, architect was... like, actually can we have it in green <laughs> yeah well then you yeah. just would do so much post-production post-production it was such an important thing um mm-hmm. so Back in the day, um, photography drove our imagery more than anything. And it still right. does now. Great photography is the base of everything to do with good visualization, I feel. So to start with a great kind of exterior image, you have to have a good photographer or be a good photographer yourself. You have to great, take great photography of that site and that asset. And mm-hmm. then it was rendering the building into it. And then you would render in layers. So you would render like the base of the building and then the ambient occlusion pass and then all the materials and, da, 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 and build it all up basically. So if that client came back and said, hey, can we have the money into a little bit darker or change this to this? You'd be like, okay, I can actually do this in Photoshop and it's going to take me 20 minutes and not like 12 hours to render it as well. So that was like the savior. But now it's like the problem flicked, done five minutes later. That's much easier. So, 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 so is, that, is, that, is that still much more the process that you use today is actually like photographs uh, as the base and then you render an, into it as opposed to just modeling the entire scene? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that is the, one of our biggest skill sets is the integration of real life environment footage, see um, mm-hmm. video or, or still uh, photography into CG. So that's a lot of our film work. That's a lot of our rendering work as well. We have great photographers in the company, great photographers we collaborate with as well, all around the world. It will go out and shoot every single project for us. Uh, it, great photography is the basis of anything. You know, it's absolutely essential. How do you deal with this with the a lot of scope changes these days? Then, or is it less of less of an issue? 
Uh, it happens all the time. It's every project, but it, I think it gets simpler and simpler with the speed of projects as well. And you can kind of handle it more with technology. And I, I mean, now the way that technology is shifting um, mm -hmm. to more of a uh, virtual reality standpoint, where a lot of our work is heading, um, those changes and shifts of interior design or exterior become faster and faster to implement in real time, basically. So it's a lot well, easier. One of the advantages I'm imagining of having a external rendering house or visualization company as opposed to having internal visualization companies is your ability to, be, number one, have your finger on the pulse in terms of like latest emerging trends in technology where you can make these enormous leaps. I can, you know, visualizers inside of a business, they might not have the resources that are being pumped into them to be able to kind of keep keep on top of trends or they might just end up just through the nature of your, you're kind of isolated inside of your own, of your own, your own practice. What, what have been some of the, the, the big leaps forward that's enabled you to, you know, get the technology to where it's at at the moment? Have these been innovations that you've developed yourself or are these innovations that are just coming out of technology, the, the general um, growth of technology? I think that every visualization studio and I mean, again, we're a full service agency, full service agency, but we have a visualization, a very dedicated visualization studio as part of our company. Mm -hmm. um, every visualization studio builds their own techniques. I wouldn't say technology, but they'll build their own techniques and structure of how they produce work. And each, right. I think each studio has similar sort of roots and structures, but they all have their own ways of doing things and own assets and things like that. The technologies, I think, traditionally. Uh, over the past 10 years have all been worked on together so you kind of you know everyone a lot of people in our industry their basis is using 3 Studio max uh now it's corona as opposed to it was v-ray a little bit before i think now corona is obviously sort of the, the driving kind of render engine and um and, and that's kind of driven um a, a lot of the industry i'd say over the last 10 years um there are certain companies that have developed internal scripts like we have that kind of refine those processes make them faster and faster and give a certain look and output to our work and obviously we train all of our staff in those sort of techniques but now we're kind of coming to this incredible new dawn and horizon that we've been working on for the past two years which is making this big big fundamental shift as a company over to the unreal engine Mm -hmm. um, which is going to be kind of our next chapter in a way, basically, of how we sort of deliver our projects as we kind of move fully over to that platform. Could you speak a little bit more about what, what Unreal is, how it's been developed and, and what it's enabling you guys to be able to do? I'll let Matia take that one. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Unreal, I remember when I was, um, I think it was high school or something, Unreal Engine was a video game. Yeah. Um, it was a video game engine. Um, from there, I think there has, it has been dormant for, for a long time because the hardware was not there to support to the level that's now. But it's basically a video game engine, uh, but you can develop anything on top of it right now. And it's becoming very much user friendly. So I've seen a lot of big uh, architecture firms, um, you know, starting to dip their toes into it. Maybe not so much with Unreal Engine, which is a bit more complex, but with uh, Twin Motion, which is a derivative right. pro product of, of Unreal Engine that's now actually part of Unreal Engine. And uh, this is this is really a big enabler for uh, for uh, access to to this level of immersion that we are all experiencing nowadays. Obviously, Facebook came out with uh, their fancy name for for Meta, mm -hmm. but actually, Meta the Metaverse was actually out there for a long time. Um, it's, not, it's not it's not anything new. Metaverse means something that happens digitally and it's all interconnected. And but we're seeing like these these big softwares they're basically just making this whole thing way easier for everyone to access to. Uh, a Metaverse could be this digital world where you can upload your um, for instance, your 3D model, and it will live digitally into like a, a digital New York City. So you have your own plot of land. But we're, we're, we're starting to talk about something that's maybe 10, 15 years out there. Mm -hmm. um, what's real right now is we have access to this new software that allows for um, asset creation at a speed that was not uh, there before. 
Um, and it's, it's basically really like building a video game. So you build the entire um, world, digital world. And from there, you just take all the screenshots that you want um, as renders. You do all the animations that you want. The, the quality as of right now is not necessarily the same that we have. Um, not necessarily comparable to what I call offline render engines like Corona, V-Ray, and all the other ones. Mm -hmm. But it's getting so close that the leap is, is happening. So that's why we want to we want to make sure that as a company we are um, trained and we're ready. We are already ready. <laughs> yep. We are we've made the leap already, and uh, we've started to um, we've started to deliver products like rendering and animation with that new software. The, the final client doesn't necessarily need to understand the technology. I think at the end of the day, the final result is, is what matters. But Unreal Engine has also enabled like new ways of, of designing spaces. Uh, you have probably seen people wearing those uh, fancy goggles, VR goggles. That is all connected through either um, either Unreal Engine um, or other um, game engine that are out there. So um, it just, I, I really, again, it's just an enabler for the next generation mm -hmm. of um, content that we can produce. How, how do you guys work with in-house visualization studios then? So some of these, practice, these companies that you've been talking about, KPF Fosters, um, I, I think about a company like um, Zaha Hadid Architects, obviously are well known for their, you know, really pushing the envelope in terms of parametric design. Um, how do you successfully integrate then with their in-house visualizers and where do you kind of start their work and when do they kind of back down, if you like? I think traditionally um, the in-house visualization departments um, will be kind of allocating their own work while they'll be kind of like producing their own rendering work, et cetera. And then the head of that department, like um, Gamma, for example, at Foster and Partners, a very good friend of mine, mm -hmm. um, they'll be allocating work out as well to certain visualization departments they work, the visualization teams they work with on a regular sort of basis. Right. So it's, it, 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 there's not, I say, a huge amount of collaboration that, I mean, in the past, past, yes, there has been. Um, like a long time ago, but of recent time, it's more work is kind of separated. Like, hey, are you guys doing X images or X animation? We're doing Y, and it's those files are shared, and you know they're they work on the same platforms like Three D Studio Max or things like that, and they're, mm -hmm. you know they're, they're shared across evenly. Um, so it's it's all pretty pretty fluid and seamless, I think, over the years. Um, there's been some huge shifts, I think, in in house visualization teams over the years, which is obviously sort of another subject, but that's that's quite fascinating. And and does it become something like where, you know, you guys are kind of pushing the envelope in terms of your own investments in technology infrastructure that you'll naturally influence in-house visualizers to up their game, if you like? Uh, yeah, I'd like to say so. <laughs> I'd like to say so. But but also, you know, there is tremendous investment from some of the from architecture firms into their in-house visualization teams. Sure. That is super impressive where they really do kind of go above and beyond sometimes and turn around work in incredible timeframes. Um, I mentioned uh, Gamma at Foster and Partners, those guys do incredible work. Um, and, you know, to the uh, the teams at KPF as well and SOM and beyond, like they're, they're pretty amazing. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a really nice relationship and collaborative process because you, you kind of have to work together and balance off each other. It's not one who's better than the other, I don't think. I think it's a very kind of even relationship. And they also, as Mattia knows, and I know as well, when you work in-house as an architecture firm, you are under like intense stress and intense situations. So you have to learn techniques of how to produce good quality work in a very, very short amount of time, um, which is adaptable as well, which you can then come back and change all kinds of things if you need to. Um, and that, that in turn you know, teaches some great skill sets. So you often find that you get great artists that have worked at, uh, at in-house firms for sure. And I think that now as well, I mean, graduates from architecture school, part one and part two, they all learn through the Studio Max, you know, whether it be on their own or part of their courses and they're learning V-Ray and Corona and they're producing renderings that's part of their scope. And some of the work they're producing is fantastic. So you see more and more that uh, certain architecture practices will hire those 
uh, those graduates to be part of their team, and they are almost like the 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 rendering guy on the team in a way as part of the architecture team, as opposed to sitting within the rendering department too. And that's because it's just such an important process, I think. Mm. We were talking earlier about uh, the fact that you have developed offices in remote, lo- well, in locations where your clients are, and that's been a, a big factor in actually being able to offer a really top tier concierge like service where you're developing relationships. But it's not easy. It's not easy to actually go and and to and to do that. What have been some of the challenges, particularly? And again, this is my own personal interest here. You know, working with, <laughs> with, with business of architecture, and you know, working with a lot of um, clients in the US, and then working with people. And what have been some of the challenges that you found around setting up international offices? And has it been a case where you've um, focused on, say, hiring local talent, or have you been taking talent and exporting it to places and locations where you need? Yeah, it's it's definitely a challenge, no matter how you do it. It was a huge undertaking about eight years ago for the company to say, you know what, this is our business model, and we think that this business model is going to be quite expensive, but we're going to mm-hmm. take a lot of our cash flow and, and target it towards kind of this 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 type of growth, I guess. And it paid off really well in terms of kind of building those relationships. But in terms of structure, um, you know, the the initial structure was really, hey, we're going to create, for example, a business in Hong Kong. We're going to then um, train and hire a team coordinator, team manager, basically, that will either come from our London office or will be hired locally and then trained. Mm-hmm. Um, that person will then arrive there. We'll then either, and we do this a lot, we'll then either get a lot of our UK employees that want to move uh, visas and then move them across, basically, to work closely with those clients. And so it was a huge endeavor of like, hey, we're going to have this team and we're going to populate it to sort of, you know, up to sort of 10 people or something within a sort of a one year time frame and we're going to try and facilitate that collaboration between our clients who are there on the ground and this team as well it's um it, it's not an easy task and i um and doing it across sort of five offices as well is even yeah. more complicated and multiple time zones too um and i guess it kind of lends itself to the sort of the business model of um, architecture firms like Gensler, which, which work in those methods, SOM in particular. But I think upon reflection, um, we kind of shifted into sort of more of a headquarter type operation where we were saying that, you know what, London is our actual, London and New York are our headquarters and that's where we have majority of our staff. Mm-hmm. We should really centralize a lot of production to those areas. And then really those other locations and offices that have project management, account management within them, they can have build up those close relationships effectively. So it's a, it's, it's a interesting process for sure. And have there been any easy one? Have there been any sort of systems or processes that you've developed? So like you you now have a a checklist, if you like, of like here's how we're going to set up a, a business or an, a new office in a in a location. We, we do. Yeah. I mean, we have a great um, administrative team at Visual House that uh, that handle a lot of, of those mm-hmm. those those structures, the accounts team effectively um, that, 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 that structure out sort of the process of doing that. And it's not, you know, I'd say that that isn't sort of the more complex part of things, you know, setting mm-hmm. up the entities and bank accounts and things like that. That could be sort of fairly straightforward. I think it's more the human resources side of things, which is really kind of like takes its toll of like this is, you know, more of a challenge having the right teams in place. Mm. for sure how, how have you how have you gone about managing the kind of consistency of work throughout the company particularly when you're you know expanding into new territories well um i mean i'll let matthias sort of speak specifically about his team but in general across the company we have like um uh heads of departments effectively which mm-hmm. are effectively like art directors so you have creative and production digital as well and those departments were led by um creative directors or, or heads of departments that, that previously in a previous life were art directors so you have that sort of managed and general quality of a standard that the company has and the aesthetic of the company too so what mm-hmm. visual house stands for as a brand and what works acceptable work isn't and then even underneath them you have associate creative directors further art directors as well and then you have the team underneath them that has that sort of senior management as well but um but it, it takes a lot of work as well. I'm sure Matthias will tell you that like going into the details and the weeds of commenting and things like that is a challenge. Yeah, I think uh, obviously that on a large scale, that is exactly how we operate on a, on a daily basis is that we, we do have to have a centralized platform that we I, 
did identify in in one name that mm-hmm. we use. Um, there are there are a few, um, but it's something that it's not new in our industry. I mean, we always had blackboards, like whether they're local blackboards or you know they're shared on the network. Right now, you can have this blackboard on online, so it can be accessed from anywhere uh, by anybody. And it's basically we just build a structure where um, and it's very well linked to Asana. This is where the whole thing come, comes to right. play. So when you assign a task, you need to see the task visually on that other platform. Then it gets reviewed, all comments from either the client or the app director on the project. As in a very simple, in a very simple um, explanation of how the process is, it really is about having a server that's much, very much more visual than just a bunch of folders. Right. Um, obviously we have, we need to have, um, a lot of discussions internally as far as, Hey, how, how do you want this, uh, the look of the projects to be? So it's, it's, it's also a bigger conversation with the developer, the client, the architect. So normally the art director or the head of the department would make sure that the product gets out to the best quality possible and to the quality that meets our standards. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you uh, deal with managing then different teams in different countries? Because it's, it's kind of a, uh, with, when, when, yeah. you, when you're starting to get lots of um, satellite offices, then it is effectively like remote working in a sense. Yeah, I think now we, we kind of, as I sort of mentioned before, we kind of have this department structure which now mm-hmm. is sort of, you know, creative production, et cetera, where you have less teams in a way. So it's not sort of Hong Kong, it's creative or, or production. And I see. So those people in Hong Kong awesome. might, yeah, they might still be in Hong Kong and they're still working in that department, but it's more structured in that sort of mm-hmm. way. So effectively now it is all remote, but we have this really nice fluid system effectively where everyone actually remotes into their work computer effectively where if they're, if they're in an office they would even still remote in, in, a, in a subsequent office they'd still remote into their work computer and all the work computers are based uh, in uh, either london or new york right so um everyone's all working on one centralized system effectively so they're all kind of there within a network even if they're not physically there and that allows cross collaboration with file sharing very easily uh, allows tech chat communication very easily and of course, we have um, our own integrated project management software and basically the hub of all of Visual House called Creative House, which is a software that we developed ourselves uh, over the past 10 years, which actually manages all of our projects. And we're actually releasing a new version of it uh, at the end of this year, which will become more of a, um, a, a, a sort of a, a great presentation tool for our clients as well. So it's a, a really kind of nice, nice centralized hub in a way for the company. Um, what does business development look like? In Visual House, how do you win? Getting how do you planes. win? <laughs> Getting on planes to back off again. Um, uh, how does business development work in the Visual House? I mean, we 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 do a lot of business development, definitely. Um, but our business development is what I would call very very natural and organic. Mm-hmm. Um, we have we've been around for a long time, you know, fifteen years now, over fifteen years, and that collaboration of clients from day one built great relationships almost friends in a way with a lot of our clients yeah and that in turn has led to great references and projects and 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 really kind of like a, a great portfolio for the company so we do we definitely do a lot of outreach we definitely do a lot of physical in-person meetings and presentations to sort of set clients in all of our various areas um and and really it's 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 a very the the process of scoping a new project and bringing a new project on board is a very very collaborative one Mm -hmm. and it's something that we put a sort of a a vast amount of effort into as well i think um yeah brilliant a lot of flying (laughs) and what's the the rest of 2022 and the future for 2023 got in hold for visual house finishing a lot of projects i think (laughs) it's getting (laughs) getting everything done for christmas is the, the biggest push um, but we have a lot of projects to finish up uh, towards uh, a lot of sort of internal deadlines. Um, we're launching Creative House, which is our sort of new uh, integrated platform. Uh, sorry, uh, the latest version of Creative House, which is our kind of, uh, uh, as I said, project management system, now presentation tool as well. Hmm. Um, that'll be happening in this year. And then we have our really our 15 year celebration too. So that's exciting. And coming together with clients and employees and everything else. So just, 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 just hard work, really. 
Brilliant. Love it. Well, I think that's a perfect place for us to conclude the conversation then. Thank you so much, Robert and Matteo, for giving us a, 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 a deep dive into the behind the scenes of, of visual, house, visual House, how you procure work, how you um, move into business development and also some of the business mechanics as well. Really, really fascinating stuff. So thank you very much. Our pleasure. Thank you for having us. Our pleasure. Thank you so much. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.